قد أفلح المؤمنون أعود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآله With respected Muslim brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today we are going to be discussing a topic which I have wanted to do a discussion on for a very very long time It is one of my favorite Topics is a very interesting topic. No doubt it is one that is very near and dear to many of you, especially those of you who grew up in a predominantly Shia community. And today's topic is going to be the legendary sword of Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam alayhi wa And actually, before we, before we dive in, I just want to point something out. I think the, the calling it the sword of Imam Ali is a misnomer because it's, it's very interesting. When you look at the reports, they all call it the sword of the Prophet. Like all the ahadith call it the sword of the prophet. When we, we see the ahadith in our books that talk about the way the imams inherited it, one from the other, they would inherit the sword. It's called the sword of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But for some reason, like a lot of people imagine it as just being Ali's sword. We have to remember that it was the prophet's sword before it was Ali's sword. And today we're going to be going over some interesting facts about this sword. We're going to go over what it looked like. We're going to go over where it came from. We're going to go over the meaning behind its name. We're going to go over where it is today. And this topic is, is of course, very near and dear to, to many of our hearts. Because for us, like, Batman's utility belt is not real. You know, the Iron Man suit is not real. That's, that's all, like, kid stuff. That's all movies. It's cartoon. But this sword, this weapon is real. This is our weapon. When we read about Amir al-Mu'mineen's exploits in battle, when we read about what this sword did at Uhud, what it did at Khandaq, Khaybar, Hunayn, you know, uh, you know, you read about what it did in, in Yemen, you read about what it did in Harb al-Jamal, in, in Harb Safin, in Nahrawan, it's, it's amazing, it's inspiring, it's beautiful, it, 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 you know, I've said this to a few of the brothers, when we're talking about fiqh, we're, you know, we're talking, you know, we're adults, we're talking about Tafsir, we're adult. But we, when we talk about Marazi, we talk about the battles of Imam Ali, all of us become like children. You know when you're a child and you're hearing about the, the battles of Imam Ali as a young child? It's the coolest thing ever. It's really cool. It's very difficult not to just geek out over Ali ibn Abi Talib's everything about him. Everything about him. The way he talks, the way he walks, the way he dresses, the way he eats. Just everything about him. And, and his weapon, his sword, is no exception. The sword he... he gained from the Prophet وسلم, is no exception. So that being said, we're going to cover the, the topic in the following stages. First, we're going to go over some misconceptions. We're going to go over some, some famous misconceptions. Then we're going to go over the, the name of Ali's sword, the name of the of Dhul Fakar, and we're going to go over the meaning behind it. Like, what does the name mean? How did it get this name? Hmm. We're going to talk about where it came from, because the report's Regarding where it came from are contradictory. There are some contradictions here. We're going to we'll see if we can sort through them. We're going to talk about how when Ali used it for the first time and some of the things he did with it. We're gonna, and then lastly, we're going to talk about where it is now. That being said, let's go ahead and get started. So first things first, when it comes to the origin of Dhul Faqah, there's a few misconceptions to clear up, mainly two of them. Number one, it has been narrated many times from many a khatib, from many a you know, uncle at the mosque, that Imam Ali's sword is referenced in the Qur'an when we see the verse in Surah Al-Hadid, it says, وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدِ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ Allah says in the Qur'an, and we sent down iron with its great might, benefits for humanity. This verse, there are some people who will tell you, it's like, this is about Dhul Fatah. It's like when Allah says, we sent down the iron, he's talking about a, a very specific piece of iron, he's talking about Imam Ali's sword. And so, the tafsir for this is narrated by Ibn Shahar Ashub in his book, Manaqib al-Abi Talib. He narrates it from a, a now lost book called Tafsir al-Suddi. A uh, Suddi was an early figure, and a Suddi narrates it from Abi Salih, from Ibn Abbas, and so he narrates that this verse is about the sword, and that this sword was originally sent down to Adam, and it was inherited from one prophet to another until it eventually reached Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now here's the thing. This chain is completely unacceptable because the narrator here is Badam Abi Salih, 
who is a known liar, who is a known fabricator of stories and traditions. So this tafsir is not one that I would say is reliable, as in there's no other corroborating evidence for it. You know, wallahu akbar. I mean, if we had more corroborating evidence, perhaps we could say perhaps that is one of the meanings of the verse. But if Badam is the only one narrating it, that is usually a sign that it is a fabrication. The other misconception that I would like to go over is the appearance of Dhul Faqar. So Dhul Faqar, when we look at its appearance, I have been unable to find a scholar earlier than Ibn Shahr Ashub who says that the sword had two heads, who said that the sword had two barbs, that popular image of Dhul Faqar, whether it's a, a painting, a movie, TV show, Imam Ali is always depicted with a, so, uh, with a sword that has two heads. We don't know the reason why, like where this came from. It's, it's in Ibn Shahar Ashub's book, but it, it doesn't really, it's not really corroborated. It's not really corroborated. And again, I want to point out something here. When we say these things, it's not with the intention of causing disunity, but there are people out there who like to take the advantage. Whenever they hear something like this, they want to be edgy and they want to like tekfir us over Dhul Faqar's appearance. They want to start cursing their fellow Shia. And so I advise people just not to give any of these fanatics any attention. It's, it's really not worth it. You know, we like to do historical analysis. We like to look for the facts. We don't like to, to be edgy and, and start arguments for the sake of arguing. It's a waste of time. So when it comes to Dhul Faqar's appearance, we will cover what the sword actually looked like according to some of the reports that have reached us, inshallah. So the first thing we're going to go over now that the, the sort of misconceptions are out of the way is that what does this sword, what this sword, what does it mean? When it comes to weapons in history, it is when a weapon gets a name of its own and it becomes like almost a character un unto itself in the history books, that is an indication that this weapon is very special. This weapon is indeed a very, very special weapon. So there are two reports that give us indication as to its name. The first report is narrated by Sayyidina Abu Hamza Thumali who says, I once asked Muhammad ibn Ali al-Baqir and those of you who have been following us for a while, you know Imam al-Baqir is the expert when it comes to the seerah, when it comes to the life of, of Amir al-Mu'mineen and the life of Rasulullah. So he is definitely the, the authority on this. And so he says, I asked him, I asked Imam al-Baqir why was Ali's sword called the faqar so he replied, because no one was struck with it from Allah's creation without being impoverished from this world, in this world from their family and offspring, and being impoverished in the hereafter from paradise. This is an amazing report, and it is narrated in two of Sheikh al-Saduq's books. Sheikh al-Saduq transmits this in his book, al al sharaa in volume 1, page 310 to 311, hadith number 298, as well as his Ma'an al-Akhbar. This is a, a really, really interesting report, and we're going to go over why. The word here that is being described is the word faqr. So faqr can mean poverty. So according to this report, if this report is correct, it says, it, Imam al-Baqir is saying that the reason why it's called dhul faqar is because it, it inflicts two poverties on you at once. One poverty is that if, if, you're, if you're hit with this thing in this world, you lose your family, you lose your children, you lose everything. You lose everything in this world. You are now impoverished in this world. And secondly, if you get hit by, with this sword, you get hit with Rasulullah's sword, it means that you are impoverished of paradise. You lost in this world and in the hereafter. And this hadith is awesome. <laughs> this hadith is awesome. There's no way, there is no way to uh, go around it. The next report, there is another report. So there are two, as I said, there are two reports regarding the name of Dhul Faqar. Two of them, and, and I will leave it to you to decide for yourself which one you believe is more reliable, which one you believe is more, has, carries more weight. The second report is from a Sheikh al Kulaini, from Thiqatul Islam Kulaini, who narrates from his teacher. Thiqatul Islam Kulaini, those of you who have, have studied his biography, studied his teachers, will know that he had a teacher by the name of Alan, Alan al Kulaini, who was his uncle. So Alan al Kulaini narrates this hadith in a marfu' manner. He narrates that Imam al-Sadr alayhi salam said, the reason why the sword of Imam Ali was called Dhul Faqar is because it, what's it called? Is because it had a spine. You know, the word Faqar, you know, we said it can mean poverty, but another thing like Faqara, it means like a groove. You know, we talk about a human spinal cord, talk about the Faqara, 
So the reason why, the, according to this report, the reason why it's called the Fakat is because there was a line in the middle of the blade's length. Like right down the sword, there was a groove resembling, resembling a spinal column. Hence, it was called the Fakat. And the narration, Imam Sadiq says it was the sword that was sent down from the heavens by the angel Jibra'il, salamullah alayhi, and its hilt was made from silver. And he, Jibra'il, was the one who called out from the heavens, there is no sword but Dhul Faqar and no youth but Ali. And this is a, I know we say we're done with the misconceptions, but this is another actually very popular misconception. Many people today, when they recite this poem, they, they flip it. So they say, لا فتا إلا علي لا سيف إلا ذل فقار. But when we look at the reports in our books of hadith, they say it's the other way around. لا سيف إلا ذل فقار لا فتا إلا علي. So these are the two reports transmitted by Shaykh Nas Saduq, Rahmatullah Ali, in his books in the Ilal uh, Shara'a and Ma'an al Akhbar. And Allahu Alam, which one is correct? Perhaps they're both correct. It's not hard to imagine that they are both correct, that the sword, its name comes from both its appearance as well as its characteristics. But me personally, I think I think both of the reports are fine, that you can accept both of them. And I think it's it, it just adds to the mystique of this weapon as such an awesome name. The origin of Dhul Faqar, we've sort of referenced this. There are two different ver stories regarding where this sword comes from. So one of them is primarily narrated by the Mukhalifin, the other one is primarily narrated by the Ahlul Bayt. And we, of course, will, will show them both to you. Obviously, we take the reports of the Ahlul Bayt over the reports of the Mukhalifin. The first report is that the sword originally belonged to a man named Al Munabbih ibn al Hajjaj. Al Munabbih ibn al Hajjaj was a kafir, he was a pagan, he was an enemy of the Prophet, he was an enemy of the Muslims, and he was slain by Amir al Mu'mineen at the Battle of Badr. So Imam Ali killed him at the Battle of Badr, and then his sword was taken as war booty. And so after the battle was over, Rasulullah chose the sword for himself. And so this has been narrated in many, many reports, but for brevity's sake, we quoted just a few of the good primary sources for you guys. So it's narrated in uh, Shanad ibn Majah, Hadith 2808, and it's narrated in At-Tabaqat al-Kubra by Ibn Sa'ad, and it's also narrated in Ansab al-Ashraf. So basically... According to this version is that it was taken as a war trophy, that Ali killed its original owner, and then it became a possession of the Prophet ﷺ. That is how it came into the, the possession of the Prophet ﷺ. This narrative is not the one that we take. It's not the one that we take. The narrative that we take to be most reliable comes from Sayyidina Mawlana Ali ibn Musa Ridha alayhi. Imam Ridha alayhi salam was once asked where Dhul Faqar came from, and he replied, Jibra'il came down with it from the heavens. It was decorated with silver, and it is with me now. And this matches the earlier report of, uh, of Thiqatul Islam Kulaini. In fact, this report is found in Al-Kafi, in Volume 1, Book 4, Chapter 38, Hadith 5. And it is also found in the, the book of Shaykh al Saduq, Rahmatullah in his book, Inun Akhbar Rida. This is a very well corroborated report. I believe there's also a version of it in Basar al-Darajat, that this sword, and this chain is authentic. The chain is uh, is very, very good. And I believe there's also a reference to it in Qurb al -Isnad, that this sword originally was brought from heaven. So this is Sahih. It's Thabit Indana from the A'imma alayhim salam. It's a very, very interesting report, uh, or an interesting issue we see here, that the, the Mukhalifin, for them, this was just a sword that a kafir owned, and then it became the prophets. And then for us, it's like, no, this sword came down from heaven. And this is something to be expected because we've seen that whenever there's something that ties Ali and his wife Fatima to Zahra, as we previously discussed in, in her merits, whenever there's something that ties them to the will of Allah, like Allah chose for this couple to get married. Allah chose this weapon for Ali Allah. Allah chose him as the Imam. This is considered very problematic. This sort of narrative cannot be acceptable. There has to be another narrative to match it or to eliminate it. Now, we ask the question, how did Imam Ali acquire it? Because as we said, this sword was brought down to the Prophet ﷺ. How did it become the sword of Amir al-Mu'mineen? If any of you have seen Film al-Risala, in the movie you see that during the Battle of Badr, Ali is one of the three duelists. Right? And, and feel free to go back to our video on the Battle of Badr. If you watch the movie, you know, you can't see Ali. You won't see Ali, you'll see the sword and you'll see the two barbs. So this is a, a, you know, we already covered that that's not what the sword looked like. And secondly, Ali did not use Dhul Faqar during the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr, he, he did not have Dhul Faqar yet. 
So the, the battle in which Ali used it for the first time is during the Battle of Uhud. And there is a story behind it. And it is one of the most epic stories out of any of the Marazi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I narrate to you this hadith and it is a very well corroborated hadith. It is narrated by our master Jafar ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq he narrates, and this is coming from Ila al Shara'a, he narrates that when the Muslims had routed, when things had gotten bad, many of the companions of Rasulullah fled, as many of you know, and Rasulullah was left with only a few defenders. And so there are three Sahaba who are singled out for the, the stance they took when the, when the battle got, got bad. And so there are Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi, and Sahl ibn Hunayf, and Abu Dujana. And so when it comes to Abu Dujana, the Imam al-Sadiq, like even, even though he's narrating about the Battle of Uhud and he's about to tell you the story of Imam Ali, he stops to single out Sayyidina Abu Dujana, he stops to give him a moment. He, he narrates this story about him. So the narration tells us that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said to Abu Dujana, he said, oh, Abu Dujana, don't you see your people? Meaning the Ansar, the companions, they've all run away. So Abu Dujana replied, Ya Rasulullah, yes I do. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, join up with them. So Rasulullah is, is testing his resolve. He's not, he, it's not or, an order in the sense that I want you to join them. He's asking him essentially, why are you not joining them? So Abu Dujana said, this is not what I gave my pledge of allegiance to Allah and his messenger for. This is a very powerful line. This is that, you know, Abu Dujana is saying to to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I have a bay'ah on my neck. I pledged allegiance to you. I swore my loyalty to you. I promised that I would never abandon you, that this Islam is my religion and you are my prophet. And so Rasulullah says something beautiful to him. He says, you are released from your pledge. And Abu Dujana says, by Allah, the Quraysh will never get the opportunity to say that I abandoned you and ran away until I taste what you taste. Then the Prophet them prayed for a good recompense for him. Stop here and compare this to in Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein, we've dis discussed, when we discuss his companions, we see that between the companions of Rasulullah, between the righteous companions of, of the Prophet and the companions of Imam al Hussein, there's this similarity is that even when the Imam tells them, You're free to go, when the Prophet tells Abu Dujana, You're free to go, he's like, No, I refuse. I will stand and fight by your side until I, I die fighting for you, until I die fighting for Islam. This is true jihad, fi sabi. It's not fighting for wealth. It's not fighting for booty. It's not fighting for women. It's not fighting for land. It's not fighting for, for animals. It is fighting for the sake of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is very interesting that Imam al-Sadiq, sallallahu honors Abu Dijana, and he mentions this great mulkif, this great stance that he took. That he continues... He says, whenever a group used to attack Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ali would face them and repel them until he had killed a large number of them and injured others. As in when Rasulullah was surrounded, you know, Abu Dujana was there fighting and Ali was there fighting. And every time they would try to gather around the Prophet, Ali would manage to push them back. He would manage to hold them off. And he would ki kill a large number of them and injured many others. And so he continued fighting like this until his sword broke. So he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, a man can only fight with his weapon, but my sword has broken. So, ya Rasulullah, I've, I'm, we're outnumbered. They've, they've got us surrounded and I'm doing everything I can, but now I've lost my sword. I need a weapon. I need something to fight them with. And so Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him his sword, Dhul Faqar. Remember, this was the sword of the Prophet. He gave it to Amir al muminin He says, Ali, fight with this. Continue what you were doing, use this instead. And so Ali kept defending the Prophet using it until Mark's wounds were inflicted on him and he became unrecognizable because of the number of injuries. And so Jibra'il Ali descended and said, Oh Muhammad, this is an incomparable support from Ali to you. Says, Ya Rasulullah, in the muasat, says, even Jibra'il Salamullah is marveling at Amir al muminin He's like, Ya Rasulullah, look at what he's doing. Rasulullah replied to Jibra'il Salamullah alayhi. He said, he is from me and I am from him. And so Jibra'il replied, and I am from you both. And they heard a voice from the heavens saying, there is no sword but Dhul Fiqar. 
and there is no young champion except Ali. This report has been narrated by Sheikh al Sadduq in his book Al al Shara'a with a Sahih chain, and has also been narrated with a different chain in Kitab al Kafi Sharif by Thiqatul Islam al Kulaini. And al Kafi Sharif, there is a, a small difference in the wording. He says that Rasulullah saw Jibra'il on a throne between the heavens and the earth, and he cried out this famous poem. And many of the Sahaba heard it. This is, this is awesome. <laughs> this is one of the most amazing reports I've ever seen. And it is also narrated in the books of, of the Mukhalifin. It has been narrated by a Qabari in his tariq. It has been narrated via a chain from Abu Rafi' on one lie ta'ala alayhi. It was the Mawla of Rasulullah, the servant of Rasulullah. And it's also been narrated by Ibn al-Maghazili in his book, Manaqib Ali, Manaqib Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so this report, you find it on both sides of the aisle. We have it in the Sunni books. You have it in the Shia books. It's a very well corroborated report. But there's one report that describes the aftermath of the Battle of, of Uhud. And it, it sort of adds to it. It shows you just how, how amazing this is. Uh, Tabari reports in his book that in the aftermath of the Battle of Uhud, he says the following. He says, when Rasulullah got back to his family, he gave his sword to his daughter Fatima and said, wash the blood off of this, my daughter. Then Ali gave her his sword and said, wash this one too, for by God, it has served me well today. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you, if you have fought well, Sahl ibn Hunayf and Abu Dujan and Simak ibn Khabasha fought well with you. They assert that when Ali ibn Abi Talib gave Fatima his sword, he said, Fatima, Take the sword which is not blameworthy, for I am neither cowardly nor blameworthy. By my life I fought for love of Muhammad and in obedience to a Lord who is merciful to his servants. With my sword in my hand, which I was brandishing like a meteor, hacking with it freedmen and noble alike, I continued in this way until my Lord dispersed them and until we had slaked the thirst of vengeance for every forbearing man. I love this report. This report is amazing. This report is amazing because you have Imam Ali Salam Allah He compares his sword to a meteor. He says, I may as well have been throwing a meteor at them. You know, Imam Ali Salam Allah with that sword was like a meteor descending on the battlefield of Uhud. And and we 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 are not exaggerating when we say Allah saved Islam through Ali on this day. And we know it has been narrated by, by Suyuti in Ad-Dur al-Manthur. He says that regarding the verses uh, related to the Battle of Khandaq, he says that the Sahaba used to recite the verse, وَكَفَ اللَّهَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الْقِتَادِ بِعَلِي بْنَ أَبِي طَالِبٍ And so we know that this sword is not an ordinary sword. And Ali is not an ordinary man. And there is a reason why Rasulullah chose him specifically to take this weapon. And the fact that Jibra'il is looking at him in awe and in wonder. And he's like, Ya Rasulullah, look at this. Look at the support that he is that he is giving you. And Rasulullah proudly proclaims that he is from me and I am from him. And Jibra'il says, and I am from you both. There is a report from Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba, where Imam al-Hasan describes the Dhul-Fiqah and what his father used to do with it. It is narrated by Shaykh al saduq in his Amali. In chapter 77, hadith number 9, he says, he narrates from his chain, Al-A'mash, Rahmatullahi alayhi, from Abi Ishaq al-Subayri, from Amr ibn al-Habashi, from Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba, alayhi salam. And he narrates, he said, no banner proceeded to battle against Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, except that Allah defeated it through him and made him triumphant over, his compa over its companions and made them turn back in shame. None struck by Amir al muminins sword, the Dhul Fiqar, prevailed. When he would fight, Jibra'il would fight on his right side, Mikail would be on his left side, and the angel of death would be in front of him. I mean, I don't even know. I don't think I can, I can comment on this one. This one is just in a whole, in a league of its own. You know, we, we cannot, <laughs> there's nothing left to say. Imam al Hassan said it thus, like Ali ibn Abi Talib on the battlefield was basically invincible. It was by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that no one could could match Ali ibn Abi Talib on the battlefield. And there, where is the Dhul Fiqar now? If we wanted, we can go over like individual examples of Imam Ali using this sword, but that would basically spoil many future events, many future events covering some of these battles. So we'll save those for another day, inshallah. When it comes to the 
the issue of where is Dhulfiqar now, there are again two narratives. One narrative is that the sword eventually was inherited by the rulers of the Muslim states, the Salatin. And another, the other view is that it was in fact inherited by the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. So let's examine these two views and see which one of them holds up. The first view is uh, narrated by al tabari in his tariq. He narrates this in volume 28, the English version, chapter 210 to chapter 212. And so he narrates the following. He narrates that during the uprising of an nafs al-Zakiyyah, who is a grandson of Imam al-Hasan, salam Allah, against al-Mansur, he says that an nafs al-Zakiyyah, during the battle, he carried dhul faqar that he was using the sword of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So he says that on the day he was killed, Muhammad carried the Prophet's sword, dhul faqar When he sensed death approaching, he gave his sword to a merchant who was with him and to whom he owed a debt in the amount of 400 dinars. Muhammad said to the man, take this sword. You will not meet any member of the family of Abu Talib who will not take it and give you your just due. The sword stayed in the merchant's possession until Ja'far ibn Sulaiman was appointed governor of Medina. Ja'far was told about the sword and summoning the man, he took the sword from him and gave him 400 dinars. It stayed with him until Al-Mahdi became Khalifa when Ja'far continued as governor of Medina. News of the sword's whereabouts reached Al-Mahdi and he took it. It then passed to Musa who tried it out on a dog and the sword broke into pieces. He narrates with a, another chain to uh, Al-Asma'i. He says, I saw Harun al-Rashid, the commander of the faithful, the Abbas Khalifa, in Thus girded with a sword. He said to me, O oh, Asma'i, would you like me to show you the faqar Yes, I said, may God make me your ransom. He said, unsheath the sword of mine. I did so and I saw on it 18 notches like vertebrae. These reports indicate that the sword of Rasulullah eventually ended up in the following Amir al-Mu'minid. It ended up among the descendants of Imam al-Hasan. And then it was eventually taken by Ben al-Abbas. And then from Ben al-Abbas, it passed on to other rulers. And now they are claiming it is in the, uh, I believe, in the Tupkapi Palace in Istanbul in Turkey. There is a, a report in Musannaf Abdul Razak that says something very similar. So this is Musannaf Abdul Razak in volume 5, page 295. At 9,662, 9,663, we have a report from Imam al-Sadiq, which is narrated uh, by Ibn Juraj. So you may know Ibn Juraj. Ibn Juraj was a, a, someone who narrated from Imam al-Sadiq, but he was not on the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam So Ibn Juraj says, I asked him about the sword of Rasulullah. So he said, I saw the sword of Rasulullah. Its hilt was made of silver. Its uh, ends were, uh, tilt was made of silver, and there's a silver lining between them. And he said, it is with these people, meaning Banu al-Abbas. So according to this hadith, Imam al-Sadiq is confirming, it's like, yeah, the sword is with, it's with Banu al-Abbas. Let us look at these reports. Let's say, like, what, do we agree with these reports? Is there an issue? We say, yes, there is definitely an issue. First of all, the reports themselves do not add up. Tabari's reports, the first one indicates that an nafs al-Zakiyya had the sword. But this is simply not true. Because we know that the sword was not passed down to the grandchildren of Imam al-Hasan. It was passed down, it was given by Imam al-Hasan to his brother Imam al Hussein. And we'll show you a report in a second that, that proves this. In order to prove this, there is a hadith in al kafi sharif in volume 1, book 4, chapter 38, hadith number 7. So he narrates the following. And this hadith is narrated by Humran ibn Ayyun, I believe, uh, Allah He reported that he once asked Abu Jafar, uh, salam Allah alayhi, Imam al-Batr. He said to him, uh, he was asking him regarding some of the relics that were given to Umm Salama. So the Imam alayhi salam said, when Rasulullah passed away, Imam Ali inherited his holy arms and whatever was therein, and it was transferred to Imam al-Hasan, then to Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam. However, we became anxious about losing them and we decided to leave them in the trust of Umm Salama. Afterward, Imam Ali ibn al-Husayn alayhi salam took custody of the arms. I then said, yes then, it is true that it was transferred to your father and that it ended up with you. This hadith is, is a very, very good chain of transmission. And it shows that first it went from the Prophet to Imam Ali, then from Imam Ali to Imam al-Hasan, then from al-Hasan to al-Husayn, and Hussein left them the items with Umm Salama before going out to Karbala. He did not fight with Dhul Fiqar at Karbala. Then when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was martyred, Imam Zain al-Abideen eventually comes back to Medina. He retrieves these relics and then they're passed on to Imam al-Baqir and then to Imam al-Sadiq. So we know 
that the report of it being with a nefs Zakiyah is definitely not correct. This is not true. Secondly, we see that the second report, it doesn't match the third report. So the second report says that when it comes to the uh, the sword, it, it was taken by one of the Abbasid governors. It was bought by a merchant, and then that merchant gave it to Jafar ibn Sulaiman. Then Jafar ibn Sulaiman gave it to Al-Mahdi, and then his son Musa ibn Muhammad al-Hadi, al-Hadi al-Hat, the son of al-Mahdi, used it on a dog, and then the sword broke to pieces. I mean, how does a sword break to pieces when you hit a dog with it? I don't know. But continuing on, the next report says that Harun al-Rashid had it. And that he showed it to al-Asma'i. I don't understand. Was the sword broken or did it end up with Harun al-Rashid? So it appears that Imam al-Sadiq's narration to Ibn Juraj was simply taqiyya. That Imam al-Sadiq was saying this because he knew that Banu al-Abbas at this point were claiming that they have the sword. They were trying to boost their own legitimacy. And so... We have another report from Imam al-Sadiq where he explicitly confirms that he has the sword of the Prophet So it is also in Al-Kafi in the same chapter as before, only this one is Hadith 1. It's a long report. We're not going to read the whole thing, but we are going to read the relevant part. So he says, Sa'id al-Saman says he was with Imam al-Sadiq and he was asked regarding who uh, two men who were visiting the Imam. So you reply, they belong to the Zaydiyya sect and they think that the sword of the Prophet وسلم, is with Abdullah ibn al-Hasan. Imam, the Imam السلام, said, they have lied, may Allah condemn them. I swear by Allah, Abdullah ibn al-Hasan has not seen it with his own eyes, nor even one of his eyes has seen it. Even his father, even if his father had seen it, except if he might have seen it with Imam Ali ibn al-Hussein. If they are truthful, let them say what kind of mark does its hilt have and what is the mark on its blade. With me is the sword of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa With me is the flag of the messenger, his coat of arms, his namam, and his helmet. And then the hadith continues. And we've already shown the hadith of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida sallallahu alayhi wa Imam Rida, when he talks about the sword, he says that it is with me now. And we've shown you this report before, the one in Al-Kafi and Ayyun Akbar Rida. Imam Rida says, I have the sword now. And he describes the way it looks. The concept of Dhul Faqar, why is it so important when it comes to Imama, is because there is another report, and this one is very, very important. It is narrated by Imam Rudha, and he says, when describing the characteristics of the Imam, like how do you know if someone is the Imam? He says, with him is the weapon of Allah's Messenger, وسلم, and his sword, Dhul Faqar. So Imam Rudha is saying, if someone claims to be the Imam, one of the signs of it is that he has the sword of the Prophet. This great relic of Islamic history is with the Imam. Based off of this, we know that where is the sword today? We know it is with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asli was Zaman. It is not, you know, it never went to Ben al Abbas as much as they would have wished that it was theirs. It never, um, it never passed on to the Ottomans. And the report that we just quoted is reported by Shit Saduq in three of his books. It's in it is in Ma'an al Akbar and it is in his book Al Khisar. This is a very, uh, Sheikh al Saduq loved this report. He included it in three of his books. With that being said, let us quickly just overview what we've covered. So we know where the sword came from. We know how it got its name. We have some idea of its appearance. We know that it, uh, according to the hadith of, of Thiqatul Islam Kulaini from his uncle, that it, had, it did have almost like a spinal cord down the middle, right? And we know it came from Jibra. It was brought down by Jibra'il. Sallallahu We know it was decorated with silver, and we know that it was passed down to the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, and that it is currently with the Imam of our time. We pray to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to bless all of us, to bless all of you. We thank you all for attending. And I want to, I want to know. Comment. Let us know. How do you feel about Dhul Fiqh? Does does the fact that maybe some of the things you grew up hearing about it, maybe the fact that it wasn't, it didn't look the way you thought it did. Or maybe, you know, its name, you never knew about that. How does that make you feel? I know me, honestly, when I found out that it didn't look the way that we thought it did, it wasn't that bad for me. I mean, when you read all these cool reports about it, it doesn't matter what it looked like. And to quote a a prominent uh, poet, I forget his name, but he says, any weapon in the hands of Amir al-Mu'mineen is ujfaqa. So Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamu alayhi, this sword is just one small piece of the puzzle in his beautiful biography, it is one small piece of the pu puzzle in the biographies of our imams, in the biography of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I would go so far as to argue that Ali's fiqh, his 
wisdom, his sermons, his love of Islam, right? The way he spoke, the way he transmitted knowledge. I would argue that all of that is greater than the sword. The sword is just merely a sign to show his greatness that he was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to maybe one day allow us to witness Imam Sahib al-Zaman's return and to see this sword for ourselves. So we will end this lecture with Surah Al-Fatiha. Coming to your local bookstore in Abbottabad very soon.